Good day, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Over Tourism to No Tourism, How and Why to Build a More Sustainable Tourism Industry. I'm Jen Hawes, Partnership Manager at Island Press. Before we begin, I would like to go over just a few logistics with you. This is the flow of the webinar we're gonna have today. We'll start with a very brief book introduction from Kelsey Finkel on their new book, Over Tourism, Lessons for a Better Future. Following that, Martha Honey will introduce today's panel and give a few opening remarks. And then we're gonna move into a panel discussion with a Q&A at the end. You can submit your questions at any time in the GoToWebinar control panel on the side of your uh, GoToWebinar device. Let me know if you have any questions there. And if you have any technical problems, feel free to add them into the chat and we can address them for you. We have a brief survey at the end of the webinar. We encourage you to fill this out. This will help us to continue to provide content that is free and valuable to uh, those who are attending. I'd like to give you a little bit of information about Island Press. Island Press is an environmental nonprofit book publisher. We were founded in 1984, and our mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment. We elevate voices of change, shine a spotlight on crucial issues, and focus attention on sustainable solutions, just like we're doing here today. The new book, Over Tourism, Lessons for a Better Future, is out now, and we are excited to give everyone a special 30% discount with the code WEBINAR at islandpress.org. Feel free to get your copy of the book. Now I'd like to introduce Kelsey, one of the book's editors. Kelsey Frankel is a program manager at the Center for Responsible Travel, or CREST, where she coordinates research and advocacy to promote responsible travel policies and practices globally. Her background and particular area of focus is in tourism and wildlife conservation. Kelsey is also a freelance travel writer and researcher, having supported publications for the National Geographic Traveler, Washingtonian, and other outlets. She holds a bachelor's degree in anthropology from the College of William and Mary and an MSc in primate conservation from Oxford Brookes University, where she studied the intersection between tourism and the slow loris conservation in Java, Indonesia. And with that, I'm gonna let Kelsey give some remarks. All right, thank you so much, Jen, um, for launching things off. And we also wanna thank um, Island Press for helping us along the journey of creating this book and for co-hosting today. Um, as Jen said, my name is Kelsey Frankiel, and I'm the program manager at CREST. Um, we're a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., um, with the mission to promote responsible tourism policies and practices so that local communities may thrive and steward their um, resources and biodiversity. Um, so I'm one of the co-editors of the book Over Tourism, Lessons for a Better Future. Um, CREST, Martha, and I are really excited to finally launch this book, which is several years in the making. Um, this book came out of CREST's 2018 World Tourism Day Forum, Over Tourism Seeking Solutions. Um, at that time, historic cities like Barcelona and Venice were reeling from major civic protests with residents telling tourists to go home. That year, almost 1.5 billion tourists crossed international borders and tourism's continued growth seemed assured. But then in early 2020, as you all know, COVID-19 stopped tourism in its tracks. Within a few short weeks, virtually all of the destinations we examined went from over-tourism to no tourism. But to our surprise, we found that there are even more important lessons for sustainable tourism that are emerging both from the pandemic and over-tourism. In compiling our book, we talked to practitioners in over-touristed destinations around the world, from Hawaii to Norway, New Zealand to Big Sur, Machu Picchu to the Serengeti, and so on, to better understand the unique challenges that they face. The case studies show the, like, the life cycle of over-tourism and creative efforts to find solutions. In addition, we selected a handful of travel writers and editors, travel industry thought leaders, to pen the overarching essays for different types of destinations, national parks and protected areas, beaches, world heritage sites, historic cities, and national and regional destinations. 
So to moderate our discussion today, I am honored to introduce Martha Honey, who is the CEO of Responsible Travel Consulting and the co-founder and director emeritus of the Center for Responsible Travel. Martha was an early advocate for ecotourism and is an expert on tourism and international development with um, global expertise in scores of countries. Over the last two decades, Martha has written and lectured widely on ecotourism, impact tourism and travelers' philanthropy, cruise and resort, resort tourism, coastal and marine tourism, climate change, and certification issues. Before the over-tourism book, her most recent book was Cruise Tourism in the Caribbean, Selling Sunshine by Rutledge Press from 2019. And she also has three other published volumes on ecotourism, sustainable development, and tourism certification with Island Press. She's also the executive producer of Crest Film, Caribbean Green Travel, Your Choices Make a Difference, released in May 2016. Previously, Martha worked for 20 years as a journalist based in East Africa and Central America, and she also holds a PhD in African history from the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. I will now hand it over to Martha to kick off our panel discussion. Martha? Thank you, Kelsey. And thanks as well to Crest and Island Press for organizing today's webinar on overtourism, and to all of you for joining this timely discussion. Kelsey has ably summarized our overtourism book, so let me begin by introducing our panelists, three highly respected tourism professionals who have contributed pieces to this book. Our first panelist is Arnie Weissman, the editor in chief of Travel Weekly, the industry's award winning source of, for news, research, analysis, and opinion. Arnie is also an ed the editorial director of North Star Travel Media's Travel Group, as well as the founder of Weissman Reports, now part of Travel 42. In addition, Arnie is a popular speaker at industry conferences, is widely quoted in the consumer media, and is a regular contributor to the PBS television show, The, T the Travel Detective. Our second panelist is Jonathan Turtolo, another well-known journalist, editor, and public speaker. Jonathan also runs the nonprofit Destination Stewardship Center, successor to the National Geographic Center uh, for Sustainable Destinations, a program he founded and directed. During his three decade career as a senior editor at National Geographic, Jonathan wrote about travel, geography, the environment, and science. Jonathan is also credited with originating the term geotourism and pioneering the creation of destination stewardship councils. He is, he is the primary author of the Geotourism Charter, a set of stewardship principles adapted by a growing number of, in a growing number of locales and organizations around the globe. And finally, our third panelist is Kathy Ritter, who is founder of Better Destinations, a consultancy that assists destination leaders in creating research-based customized solutions to management planning and program development. Previously, Kathy was director of the Colorado Tourism Office, where she led development on the highly regarded Colorado Tourism Roadmap, an early example of destination management planning. Kathy serves as a trustee for, uh, of the Travel Foundation based in England. And earlier this year, she was one of four North American tourism leaders recognized at Destination International CEO Summit for innovative pandemic recovery strategies. Now, for the next 25 or so minutes, it, it is my pleasure to moderate a conversation with Arnie, Jonathan, and Kathy about the origins and impacts of overtourism and what sustainable travel is likely to look like in, post, in the post-pandemic period. This will be followed by audience Q&A. Please be sure to put your questions or comments into the question panel. So now let's get started. The first question for our panelists is as follows. Why has overtourism become a problem, not just for local residents, but also for the quality of the visitor experience? And let's begin with Jonathan. Jonathan, are you with us? I'm muted. Okay, there we go. <laughs> that always happens, doesn't it? Great. Um, I was saying the quick and glib answer is that there's too many people. Um, but it's not just a matter of overcrowding, which is increasingly making residents unhappy. 
and also makes a lot of tourists unhappy unless they're going to, to uh, spring break, then they like it. Um, but seriously, overcrowding trashes natural areas. It's oil historic and archaeological sites that literally wears them down. I've seen a place in Knossos uh, in Crete where people simply touching the limestone has eroded the limestone over the centuries. That's 4,000 year old limestone they're touching. And uh, over tourism displaces uh, uh, authentic shops. It replaces them with international uh, franchises of no particular interest. I wouldn't cross an ocean just to see another Lululemon. Basically, over tourism spoils things. And that's why we need to address it. Thank you, Jonathan. Arnie, add your comments, please. Sure, and thank you for inviting me to join you today, Martha. Now, as Jonathan just mentioned, there have been destinations that have been overcrowded for time immemorial, but with over tourism, they're not merely overcrowded, they're overwhelmed. And as the book details, there are many underlying causes of over tourism, but from a big picture perspective, a major contribu contributor is that travel and in particular international travel is now within the reach of more people than ever before. So it's due in part to rising middle class in countries that have very large populations, countries like India and China. And travelers have been enabled and encouraged by low cost carriers that fly people to destinations that really weren't necessarily prepared for all these travelers. And then thanks to social media and bucket list travel, lots of people who wanna to go to the exact same place at the exact same time arrive together. So for example, even though there are, let's say, dozens of places within two hours of Venice that by any objective measure offer as much or a more pleasant experience than being in St. Mark's Square and fighting for a table. Uh, people are still gonna go to Venice because who's gonna be that close and not wanna go there? Thank you, and Kathy. Well, Jonathan, I think you'd look good in some Lululemon, but anyway, you've all mentioned that, you've all mentioned that uh, you know, some of the, some of the obvious uh, impacts of over tourism that we all experience. I, I believe there's also more insidious issues, and these can include feelings of loss, including a loss of freedom, even a feeling of being cheated. It can be deeply frustrating to discover that you can't go to your favorite place on a whim. And all of these pressures create the last thing anybody wants in their neighborhood or on vacation or in a natural area, and that's stress. Um, public land managers across our country are saying that the number of confrontations last year between visitors and park or forest personnel was at an all-time high. I think it's really important to note also that over-visitation is, is not just about impacts on people. And in fact, in some cases, it doesn't even take that many people um, to create overuse of a destination. And this can translate into impacts on land, on wildlife, and even on increasingly scarce resources like water. Thank you so much. So our next question um, is a follow-up to the first, and, and some of the ideas have already been presented by Arnie, but let's um, let's see if you can add some more to it. So over tourism is longer term and shorter term, term factors. Could each of you talk about what you see as some of the top factors contributing to over tourism? And Arnie, maybe we can um, start with you and if you could concentrate on short term um, causes, if possible. Sure. So uh, one contributing factor, a short term factor, is, is focus on certain destinations that they're having their moment in popular media, including movies, televisions, books. Mm -hmm. uh, as an example, the Singapore Tourism Board launched a campaign with Warner Brothers to coincide with the release of the film Crazy Rich Asians. Uh, part of Dubrovnik's woes, over tourism woes, can be traced to its role as a stand-in for King's Landing in the in the Game of Thrones. And sometimes it, it's not even so short-term. New Zealand is still attracting lots of tourists because the Lord of the Rings was shot there. And in a less specific sense, books like Eat, Pray, Love inspire people to travel as a way to find meaning in life. Uh, another factor that I hope is short-term and that amplifies the impact of over-tourism is the rise of nationalism and nativism. 
I mean, this brings to the surface resentment of tourists if, if they look different, speak other languages, ignore traditional and familiar behaviors and are filling the streets and restaurants and parks and buses and bars. Um, people who feel that way, who feel that resentment are immune to the travel industry's traditional economic arguments that tourism increases prosperity. They don't care about that. Um, Unfortunately, those are really the only short-term factors I could come out with. They're, they're far outweighed by long-term trends, but I'll, I'll let the other panelists go to them. Great. So, Jonathan, can you enumerate some of the longer-term factors leading to over-tourism? Yeah, and uh, Arnie brings up a very good point here with the media. Um, basically, I think of it as three things that keep growing, no matter what, including COVID. The world's population keeps growing. It's much larger than it was back in 1960 or 59 when the first jets crossed the Atlantic. There's growing affluence. It's taken a big hit due to the pandemic, but it's going to come back. And then there's growing technologies, both in transportation with uh, airliners that can carry hundreds of people. We didn't have those 70 years ago. And um, of course, with gigantic cruise ships, we'll come back to those later on. Um, and so we've got these three growth areas. And then on top of that, we have the internet impact, which has been enormous through social media, through Instagram, and through the sharing economy. Short-term rentals like Airbnb have become a big picture in how tourism works and has opened the doors in some good ways and in some bad ways. And then in addition to those, we then have government issues, mismanagement. And I'll mention three fallacies that I, that I think power this, because government not only neglects the tourism area, sometimes it fans the flames, but there is an assumption in governmental circles almost all over the world that no, number one, ever more growth is good in tourism. Number two, tourism is like any other industry, it isn't. And number three, the best way to measure tourism success is to count up tourism transactions, it's not. And until we can re begin thinking about it in a different way, uh, we're going to continue to have uh, more over tourism. And um, Kathy, I'll turn that over to you now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jonathan, you and I are very much on the same page. Um, I, I do believe that there is a deep-seated reluctance, perhaps especially in the United States, to recognize that this phenomenon is, ju is not just going to go away. Um, and it requires... Um, you know, a shift in perspective, as you were saying, Jonathan, truly addressing the impacts is going to require revisiting some dearly held beliefs. Um, public land managers, in some cases, have to grapple with the concept of limiting access, and that actually goes against their mission. Uh, there are a lot of public land managers who are trying to figure it out, um, but don't want to limit access. Um, managing too much tourism um, just requires a whole new thought process, new tools, new messages, even new alliances. And it's not an easy switch, especially at a time when so many are under pressure to achieve 2019 levels as fast as possible. Um, destination managers, destination marketers can be in an extremely challenging position. Even when they recognize a problem, they also have a mission critical obligation to keep the local tourism engine humming and there are destinations that are realizing they have no choice but to step away from a growth mindset um, but it is it is truly oftentimes a negotiation within a community about the best way of of making that switch to keep businesses thriving um, but then to protect the very character of the destination and you know it, it is going to require a whole new set of thinking new priorities and just a new way of looking at the value of tourism um, and keeping it in harmony with all of the other factors within a destination Great, thank you all, very thoughtful answers. Um, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and look at the COVID pandemic, because of course, as you all know, what we saw was that in December, 2019, tourism seemed to be on an absolutely unstoppable growth trajectory. And then lo and behold, it ran head, head on into COVID and tourism basically stopped overnight. But what we've seen during the pandemic is that different types of destinations experienced COVID, the COVID pandemic in different ways. 
some destinations have almost too quickly bounced back and even are seeing a return of over-tourism. Others continue to suffer severely from the economic loss of tourists. Could each of you describe the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on tourism in a specific type of destination? And Kathy, let's start continuing what you were talking about with, with parks and public lands. Well, for destinations with major outdoor assets, there was actually very little break in visitation. I, I said so often last year that the visitation in, in mountain towns and public lands almost created an illusion that tourism was already completely recovered, which wasn't the case along the Front Range in urban areas. Um, if, if anything, the pressures intensified last year in public lands. Um, many public lands managers reported all-time high records of visitation here in Colorado. State park visitation increased by 30 percent in one year. Visitation to the Roosevelt Arapaho National Forest was up by 200 percent. It, it was very clear that a lot of people who'd been chafing under safer at home orders and other restrictions were seeking release and freedom, and they were looking to naturally socially distancing activities in the outdoors. Um, so many, another symptom of that was that so many outdoor toys, everything from ATVs to winter backcountry gear to mountain bikes, e-bikes, stand-up paddle boards, were all in short supply and still are, and prices have zoomed. Um, one of the biggest, most unwelcome impacts of all of this um, was the sudden appearance of trash on public lands. Mm -hmm. Colorado and in the West, public lands tend to be very clean. Um, and of course, it's very easy to blame tourists when things go wrong. Um, so to create an effective response, <clears throat> it became increasingly clear that it's crucial for destinations and land managers to have solid information. So for instance, our big data platform was telling us that 85% of the visitation at one heavily impacted state park was actually from people who lived within 30 miles of the park, yeah. not travelers, not tourists. Um, so knowing which visitors are going to which parks can really help managers direct the right messages to the right people. And I think that's a learning that, uh, that really needs to continue into current times, to help us manage these impacts. Thank you. Arnie, can you talk a little bit about other types of destinations that you you where you've seen impacts? Sure. Um, you know, starting with cities, uh, I mean the, the the impact of COVID on cities as tourist destinations has in the, in the short term been disastrous. Um, I, mean, I live in New York City. I've seen the permanent closing of hotels, restaurants, bars, and retail. I mean, there are so, so many for rent signs and store windows. It's it's sad to walk down a lot of the streets and it'll take a while for Broadway to start up and recover. Now, that said, I do think cities may ultimately come out for it better than they went in. And uh, because I, I could see a, a, a burst of creativity because the city will be more affordable. I mean, uh, uh, one example, 10 years after Hurricane Katrina, uh, which devastated New Orleans tourism, uh, a decade later, there were 30% more restaurants than existed before the hurricane. I mean, young chefs were drawn there because the rents were cheap. There was an opening for them to show what they could do. And so my hope for New York and a lot of other cities is that those closed restaurants will be replaced by exciting new ones. Empty storefronts will attract new retail. And actors and artists who could never before have afforded to live in New York will flock to the city and re-energize its rebirth. Um, another uh, area where it was kind of interesting to see what happened were beaches. So, you know, beaches didn't do too badly, as, as Kathy was saying about, you know, the outdoors, there's some opportunity for social distancing. Once uh, it was realized that COVID is spread primarily by aerosols, uh, there are the beaches with the coastal breezes, you know, pr presented less and lower risk rather than than inland streets. Um, but that said, we saw what happened in Miami Beach during spring break, and that was an example of over tourism uh, at its worst. But uh, there's it's resulted in corrective action. The, the mayor of Miami Beach has said he's he is going to work to reposition the the destination in a way that will not simply attract crowds of partiers who do nothing to encourage respect or appreciation for a city. Great, thank you so much. And Jonathan, what are your thoughts? Um, 
I want to uh, actually go back to a little bit of what Kathy was saying, because uh, this is almost like a whack-a-mole situation. When COVID prevented people going to cities, they turned around and went to the countryside. And we found this in, in the work at the Destination Stewardship Report, from reports coming from all over the world that just verify what Kathy said. Serbia had a problem because a lot of tourists there would normally go to the Mediterranean to resorts. And instead, mm -hmm. they had to stay in Serbia. So they went to the Serbian countryside and expected the rural people to behave like the staff at a resort. So there was a lot of trash just being left in place. On the other hand, the rural people made a lot more money than they'd ever made before. So it's really been a, a double-edged sword in some of these rural areas. And I also want to mention Majorca, the island of Majorca, which is seen as a beach destination, even though it's a fairly large island. Um, lost a lot of the workers in its agricultural sector to tourism in normal times. Once tourism was shut down, a lot of these people went back to their home farms and cities and, and towns and whatnot in the interior of Mallorca, and now Mallorca is looking at a way to reinvigorate agricultural tourism while at the same time toning down its rec reputation as a beach and beer uh, destination. So uh, it's good news and bad news for a lot of these places. Mm -hmm. Thank you, great. So the next question is that we've seen that some destinations have used the pandemic hiatus to rethink tourism, to reassess what type of tourism they want in the post COVID new normal. Could each of you describe examples of destinations that have proposed practical and innovative mitigation strategies to address tourism and the challenges brought on by COVID? And let's start with Jonathan. Okay, this has been interesting. Um, from what we've seen, the places that are doing innovative things are the places that were suffering from over tourism before this all began. And the places that were not are going right back to the old pattern and, and uh, running fast. They wanna get heads and beds and with some legitimacy, they need heads and beds. But as far as innovative approaches, it's don't bother us right now. We're busy trying to restore our economy. But the ones that did have over tourism are doing various innovative things. A lot of them are in the book. A lot of these are mitigations like dispersing travelers and, and calling their attention to different attractions. Two places that um, we've looked at closely are Sedona, Arizona and um, the uh, Columbia Gorge, which is uh, shared between Oregon and Washington. And I mention these two because they are uh, variations on establishing true destination stewardship councils where their focus is not on promotion exactly, but on management. And in the case of Sedona, uh, the uh, destination management is, in there, is actually funded by the city and the residents of Sedona had had it with too many tourists. So they were working in lockstep to come up with, with uh, mitigations for too much travel. But they're an inland destination. They can't people, keep people from driving in. And so there's still issues to deal with there. And in Columbia Gorge, this is a splendid example of one of the best councils I've seen because it's got two states, it's got several counties, it's got a variety of uh, nonprofits and professional associations all working together and that is the dream situation because what they all have in common is the place and they're all working with over tourism problems but there's a little warning bell there which we've heard from other destinations too with dispersion dispersion helps but it's temporary and what dispersion may do is keep the overpopulated overcrowded places from getting even more overcrowded in the case of columbia gorge it's multnomah falls and even though they've got all this great dispersion going on, everybody still wants to see Multnomah mm -hmm. Falls. So same problem if you go to Paris, how many people are gonna say, I don't wanna to go to the Eiffel Tower? Not that many. We have work to do. Thank you, thank you. Kathy, what, what would you add? Yeah, I, I'll point out that last summer, Rocky Mountain National Park, which is the fourth most visited in the system, piloted a timed entry system due to the crush of interest in the outdoors. This year, time entry was just relaunched. Um, it's at Rocky and it's also in place at several other very beloved and overloved national parks, 
Acadia, um, Carlsbad Caverns, Glacier, Yosemite, Zion. I have not a doubt in my mind that timed entry is here to stay. I do applaud Rocky for learning from last year. They introduced sort of a two-part timed entry system this year. Part of the uh, part of the park is um, has timed entry between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. And another part has timed entry between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., reflecting you know, different visitation patterns. Um, personally, I'm not opposed to time entry um, as a tourism professional, as long as land managers are working closely with stakeholders to develop reasonable practices and be flexible you know, in, in the way that I just described. Um, in fact, I am 100% with Rocky Superintendent Darla Seidels, who I quote all the time, she once told me that when she travels in Rome, she doesn't expect to just walk into the Sistine Chapel. She plans her vacation around it. And she says, these national parks are our Sistine Chapels. She's got a point, but it does put a new expectation on the visitor to plan ahead and in the current parlance, know before they go. Great, thank you. Arnie, what would you add? Uh I'm going to look at, at Amsterdam. Uh, Amsterdam, and, and as Jonathan said, it, it, the places that were facing the problems are the ones most likely to take some steps. And Amsterdam was taking steps beforehand, but it really kind of ramped it up. You know, and, and I read many articles. I was saying that you know New York had felt very hollowed out, but the the a lot of the, the residents of Amsterdam felt, ah, oh, we've got our city back, and they they actually. Uh, saw the downtime as a real positive and they moved forward. So they have the most aggressive proposals that I'm aware of to regulate uh, tourism and uh, the, particularly the type of tourism they don't watch, which is by and large rowdy tourism, particularly in the red light district and around coffee shops that sell cannabis. And the mayors proposed several scenarios, all of which are somewhat controversial even within Amsterdam. One is to relocate sex workers to what they're calling prostitution hotels, which has the support of the city council, but not of the sex workers. Uh, the mayor is also proposing to make it illegal for visitors to buy cannabis. Uh, residents could still do it. Uh, perhaps the most interesting development is that Amsterdam is joined with 22 cities across Europe. And it's not just uh, Western Europe. It includes uh, two cities in Poland, too to call for restrictions on long-term long vacation rentals from platforms like Airbnb and Verbo. Uh, Amsterdam had passed some restrictions in certain central neighborhoods uh, like Barcelona. I proposed making rentals of less than 30 days illegal. Uh, Lisbon's taken a slightly different approach by providing incentive land to landlords to seek longer term rentals. But the reason that Amsterdam is uh, bonding together with these cities is they're going to the European Commission and the European Parliament because the cities, they often run up against national laws which may make regulation difficult. So for instance, Amsterdam had to, it had a complete ban on short-term rentals in three neighborhoods in the city center, but it was overturned in court. And there's several reasons why these short-term rentals are, are detrimental. Uh, one, the People, you know, it started out as home sharing, right? A sharing economy. It wasn't long before professional managers came in, bought apartment buildings, raised the rent, kicked out or kicked out if they could the, the tenants. So the character of the neighborhood changes, rents because there's less housing stock, rents rise. All of this uh, creates tremendous resentment um, against tourism in general. And when you have a city like Amsterdam that has so much over tourism, it really hit a boiling point. Thank you very much. So our final question before we open it up to quest audience questions is what are some of the emerging tourism trends coming out of COVID? Uh, what has been both, uh, what has both over tourism and the pandemic taught us that can be useful in strengthening responsible travel into the future? And let's start with Arnie on this one. Okay, uh, I, I'm gonna focus a little bit on, on the digital uh, aspect of things, uh, you know, kind of the touchless experiences that, that have really emerged. Um, and that also includes, as Kathy was saying, the advanced reservations and things like that. So the digitization is, uh, a bit of a double-edged sword in that on one hand uh, it can facilitate travel and on the other hand it can facilitate travel. I mean most of these uh, things are being developed to remove friction 
uh, from travel. So it is it makes travel more efficient. Uh, and can lessen the pain of uh, the inconveniences. But on the other hand, it also just keeps more travelers moving. But, but the upside is, and I think one of the cities that's done the most with it in a, in a positive way directly to address over tourism is Buenos Aires. And what they have done is they try to capture both cell phone numbers and people's interests before they even arrive in the city. And then they uh, have a huge uh, project where uh, they are monitoring congestion. And this goes back to sort of a, a dispersion uh, strategy. And if they see things are getting really congested in one area and they see that there are other areas that are uh, could use some, some more people, they will send notifications to people's cell phones and with incentives to try to direct them away from the places that are overcrowded and to the areas that have more space. Very interesting. Great. Uh, Kathy, what would you add? Yeah, I would say that it is increasingly clear that tourism leaders cannot simply rely on the strategies of the past. Um, an overcrowded stress destination simply cannot market its way out of the problem. Um, it is imperative that we all start looking at destination management strategies. And I'll take Hawaii as an example. Hawaii's tourism leaders had very much hope last year that the lockdown would knock visitation levels down from 10 million plus visitors per year to a far more manageable number. Their ideal number is around 6 million visitors or so. Um, in the past, half of Hawaii's visitation was international, with Japan by far the largest market. But instead, even without international travelers last year, and with some fairly restrictive quarantine and testing requirements, Hawaii's visitation once again topped 10 million, nearly all of whom were domestic travelers. Um, many came in on those brand new low cost flights. I can fly from Denver to Honolulu round trip in September for $400 on Southwest. Um, even with all those visitors, hotel occupancy didn't rebound because many of those new travelers were staying in vacation rentals, including off book properties in neighborhoods making residents upset. Hawaii is intent not so much on marketing but on managing these issues, these kinds of issues, island by island. Um, there, you know, the well-publicized shortage of rental cars in Hawaii is, is now being seen as perhaps an opportunity to create shuttles and other more sustainable modes of transportation. Um, the Hawaii Tourism Authority is also deploying information technology um, with apps and kiosks to help travelers make better decisions um, be, before their trips and during their trips and even after their trips. So it is increasingly clear that it will be vital for COVID travel, uh, for post-COVID travel to attract travelers who are compatible with the destination and then make it easy for them to make responsible choices when they're there. Thank you so much. Jonathan, finally, you, we'll, we'll sum up this section with, with your answer to this question. Um. We are uh, looking at the resurgence or not of cruise ship tourism. And I uh, like to point out that in normal times, every week, the cruise industry takes tens of thousands of vacationers out to sea. This is an excellent place for them. It's when they come in to small ports, historic ports, and other sensitive areas that we begin to have a problem. And three places come to mind. Uh, Dubrovnik has already been mentioned, but it's worth looking at this a little more closely. They began a program to get this under control under new, in, under new mayor in 2017, uh, before COVID. And they've kept right on with it during COVID. And part of the challenge was to reduce the number of cruise ships, which by one report once totaled 11 at one time. Well, they've been working with the uh, Cruise Lines International Association to get this down to two, an agreement that there'll be no more than 4,000 people in the old medieval city at one time. This is considered great progress. Uh, if you've ever seen the old medieval city, you might question that, as I do. That still seems like way too many people. 
uh, but it is an improvement. And I think we're going to be seeing more of this. In Norway, uh, in 2026, there will be a ban on cruise ships that do not meet emission standards from entering the two Norwegian fjords that are World Heritage Sites now, Geranger Fjord and that near fjord. And um, it's been pointed out that if they're too polluting to go into those fjords, well, why should they be allowed in the other? And there is now a national move to, in fact, keep them out of all the fjords. This will be interesting to see how that works out. But the 2026 ban is firm. That one's in place. And that means that uh, either they have to clean up their act enormously in terms of emissions, or it'll only be smaller expedition ships that can go into those fjords. And one other thing that, that comes into play here, and we mentioned this with Venice as well, uh, even if the res residents of a city want to control cruise ships, they may not have control over this. Port authorities do, owners of piers do. And if we look at what just happened in Key West in recent um, weeks, the citizens voted not once, but three times to limit large cruise ships. And what happened? The owner of the pier didn't like it. He gone to Tallahassee with CLIA, the Cruise Association, to protest and say the residents should be overruled. So, you know, if we go to all this work to put together councils and agreements on how we want to do tourism in our destination, and then somebody does an end run like, like that, we've lost it all. That has to become unpopular and considered the disgrace that it, that it really is. So I, I think uh, we're going to see more controls on cruise lines. They're also having some trouble uh, getting the OK from the CDC on uh, vaccinations and more trouble from the weird governor of Florida who uh, <laughs> wants to forbid them to require a vaccination certificate. Uh, I won't get into Florida politics. <laughs> but I want to end this uh, session with, with something about the numbers. We tend not to realize what numbers mean when we talk about all these millions and so on and so forth. If you assume that 2% of any group of human beings are probably, I will use a technical term here, bloody idiots, 2% <laughs> of 1 million visitors is 20,000 people. And 20,000 people can do a lot of damage. And Kathy, a lot of your land managers know that because they've <laughs> seen it. And uh, that's just 1 million visitors. And so part of the challenge is how do you either educate those people or disincentivize them and, and get better uh, handle on well-behaved tourists and, um, and favor them? So uh, there's lots of things to look at that we haven't even begun to look at yet but the numbers scare me. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you all. Your answers were great, really specific, lots of good information, and we're not done. We're now going to, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelsey and she will be fielding your questions and fielding them out to the panelists to answer. So Kelsey, take it away. All right, thank you, Martha. Um, really insightful comments. I've also been monitoring the questions in the chat. Um, we have some really great, thoughtful questions here. Um, I want to go back to the beginning of our discussion when we were talking about some of the um, the reasons behind over tourism and what influences it. Um, and we had a few different people ask about the influence of Instagram. So not only the influence of social media in, in getting people to go to, to desired destinations, but also the desire to, to get that photo, to snap that photo when they get there. Um, I'll open this up to everyone, but can you all talk a little bit about that and maybe provide some examples that you've seen? Sure, I mean, there, there this is uh, this in combination with bucket list travel, where people feel they have to go to certain places and get their picture taken here, there, and things is uh, been a, a significant uh, feeder of concentrating tourism in particularly natural areas that, uh, and and I cannot remember the name, but I think someone else on the panel might, the uh, that where a precipice comes out in Norway and gives this fantastic Ooh. view. What is it? Well, Tunga, might not be saying. Right, and, and the, the number of 
the rise in tourism from Instagram is mind boggling. Um, and I'm going to get the years wrong here, but uh, in it was maybe 2005, there were the number of visitors was, uh, is anyone, I don't know if anyone has the numbers, but I think it was like less than a thousand. And then it, it jumped into the hundreds of thousands because everyone saw that great, I'm alone at the top of the world photo uh, on their Instagram feed and it drove uh, incredible numbers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're putting me in mind of Amsterdam's decision to take down the the famous I am sign um, because it just drove over tourism. You know, it, there was an interesting trend um, in recent months and in, in the past year with uh, younger people in particular sort of experiencing travel shaming during COVID. And so there was not as much posting, but that's probably temporary. I'm, I'm very much in favor of the photographer's code of conduct, um, you know, not to attach a name to the places that they're that they're shooting um, to help with over tourism, but of course some some views are so iconic. Uh, the Maroon Bells in in Colorado, there's you, you can't really mistake it for another landform. Yeah, I think the other problem uh, with Instagram, and you know, this is an old human trait, but Instagram's made it much worse. Is the this is the bucket list as an image. Here I am in the Grand Canyon. Here I am in Paris. Here I am in front of a Mona Lisa. I'm not looking at the Grand Canyon or Paris or the Mona Lisa because I'm obsessed with taking pictures of me. Uh, I think uh, banning um, selfie sticks is a beginning, making selfie sticks unpopular is a beginning, and I am now urging any time I have a traveler audience, turn the camera around, do what we used to do, photograph the place that you're in. That's why you came here. And just to add one other place, I've, I've been looking at Big Sur for another talk that I'm giving, and they now are thinking their their huge problem is is road traffic, and particularly the iconic Bixby Bridge where everybody wants to stop and have their picture taken. And one of the things that they're contemplating is making certain days when you can't stop on the bridge, and you'll just have mm-hmm. to keep driving. So there mm-hmm. are you know there are different solutions being or efforts, innovations being talked about, but yeah, this is a big problem. And I also have heard what we were putting together the book, Instagram is sort of held out there as the biggest culprit with with selfies or uh, publicize, over-publicizing places. In Paris, there's a sign saying no selfies and symbol through the selfie stick mm-hmm. in front of the Holocaust Memorial. Consider the mentality that wants to photograph themselves in front of a Holocaust memorial. Right. right. There it is. Part of the two percent. Kelsey, maybe another question. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, I want to turn it over to Kathy actually for this next question, um, but I think there's a lot of, you know, the solutions seem so simple on paper: collaboration, monitoring, data collection, all of that. But there's obviously barriers that um, tourism boards at the state, at the regional level face. Can you talk about some of those barriers that that you've seen in the past to better monitoring and collaboration with agencies? You know, I think sometimes it is um, some some destination leaders have found themselves, um, you know, in a conflict with their own boards. You know, destination leaders often, um, you know, are answerable to a board that might be heavily um, uh, made up of hoteliers and other interests that have a, a very, you know, a vested interest in ensuring that increasing numbers of, of visitors come. And that, you know, that can put a destination leader in an awkward position. Um, you know, the other, the other, um, I think, barrier sometimes is lack of lack of information lack of, of insights. Big data is such an incredible tool for gaining insights into who exactly is coming, how long are they staying, where are they coming from, where are they going when they're there. And so when, when destination leaders have access to that kind of, uh, those kinds of insights, they can make far better decisions about who they're messaging to and how they're managing certain situations. So, so that can be a barrier. But I think Part of it also is is um, just a lack of awareness around how tourism thinking is changing, what the potential is for managing destinations in different ways. And you know, Martha mentioned that I was a trustee for the Travel Foundation. I've been I've been so influenced 
by their um, thinking around creating, you know, or taking an honest look at all of the impacts of tourism, taking a the, you know a holistic view of all of the impacts uh, and the benefits, and then addressing it all in a way that tourism becomes a net positive for the destination. I find that very powerful thinking, and I think it really sort of shines a light down the path that um, destinations can head very productively in the future. Fantastic, thank you, Kathy. Um, this is kind of an existential question that I find really interesting to think about, but it's also a management question. Um, and I think I'll start with Jonathan because I know he has strong opinions about this. Um, but someone asked, isn't it better to let some places experience over tourism and not let tourists scamper to more rural areas that aren't prepared for mass tourism activity? Well, one question is, how are you going to stop them? And um, I, you know, it reminds me of the old travel writer's dilemma I was always asked about, which is if you write about a place, do you then ruin it because people are going to come there? After social media and Instagram, forget about it every place is going to be written about and photographed. So the job now is to better educate people on how to handle that. And look at what happened in Serbia. And we saw the same thing in, in Tennessee Valley here. I've had reports of this. People going into rural areas that don't know how to behave. So we need a new way to reach these people and explain to them how to behave. And uh, Kathy, you were doing that in Colorado, right? Are, are you Colorado ready? Uh, <laughs> That was, that was an attempt to do that. Um, to look at the, the management issue, um, you know, I'm a big supporter of the idea of destination stewardship councils, and so is the Global Tourism, uh, uh, Global Sustainable Tourism Council, and thinking holistically is the first principle of the Future of Tourism uh, Coalition. But how often is it done? And one problem is with a lot of traditional DMOs, where that M stands for marketing, uh, destination marketing organization, they are funded by heads and beds. And often, as Kathy said, dominated by hoteliers. So you've got a nice cycle here that does nothing but encourage more people, more people, more people. Um, and in rural areas, there's an opportunity, I think, to do this in a different way. Um, one possibility, and Airbnb gets a lot of knocks, and deservedly so, for what happens in central cities, um, particularly with these multiple um, landlords that have developed there. But in a lot of rural areas, Airbnb can do the opposite, which is bring tourists into places that are often depressed and need some tourists. The money goes straight to the local person after Airbnb takes their healthy skim. And they are going to learn about rural areas from someone who lives there. And there's a lot of other ways to begin doing this. So I, I think there's opportunity there. And the nice thing is there's a lot of rural areas in the world. This can be spread out if it's done in a, in a thoughtful way. But it means, again, we need to have coordination, collaboration, not only within a destination, but between adjacent destinations. I live near Washington, D.C. I live in rural western Loudoun County, and there's a lot of exchange that goes on there that we haven't really discussed here yet. Mm -hmm. A lot of places like that. Thank you so well, much. I would suggest that not all rural places are created equal. <laughs> there are some, you know, there are some rural areas that that you know are craving tourism as an economic development tool. And and I, you know, I think there should be uh, programs in place to allow that to happen. Personally, mm -hmm. um, but there are also, I've and, and I've really recently become attuned to the fact that there is a, a large body of thought around the fact that some natural areas should be protected from any vis visitation. There are areas that are so fragile. Um, you know, it is, not, um, it is not always welcome when a tourism manager talks about dispersion of visitors to less visited places because there are people who believe that some places are sacred and should be preserved. And so I think there has to be sensitivity to that as well. And I'll just one last thing I'll say, consider the e-bike. <laughs> the e-bike um, is an is a wonderful tool for replacing cars in some cases. If you can convince people to take e-bikes to trailheads, then perhaps you can reduce parking congestion. But the downside of the e-bike 
is that it gives people freedom. People like me, who may not be uh, up for mountain biking for 10 miles, gives me the ability and others the ability to penetrate deep into natural areas um, where we, you know, we couldn't have gone before. And so there, there are, <laughs> there's considerations around each one of these, each one of these travel tools, each one of these opportunities that I think, you know, going back to what I said earlier, just needs to be balanced. The, the benefits need to be balanced against the impacts, and we need to figure out good ways of managing all of these. And, and I think there's this ironic tug of war. war. Uh, on one hand, there are some really well-planned tourism developments, Cancun. Uh, Punta Cana, where, where people with forethought said, we want to build something here. They, the infrastructure was put in place. The local people bought in. The, the people who work there, by and large, happy to have the jobs. Um, but it's, it's ironic in the sense that people who want an authentic experience say, well, Cancun's not Mexico. You know, I want to I wanna go into, into real Mexico. And these people who want like the authentic experience are often the same people who might decry over tourism and this but but you know they're they're going to go to places that are are not actually built for tourism so it's it's a really interesting sort of tug of war uh that goes on around the world in this regard absolutely no those were all really thoughtful um i think there's one question that really kind of gets at the heart of of this and um, I want to pass it to Martha, um, who I know also has strong opinions about this question, but um, one of our uh, attendees asks, how can we capitalize upon um, tourism income without getting those higher numbers of visitors? Because mm -hmm. there are lots of destinations right now that, that really need that income. Right. Yeah, I think this is just as, as Arnie was uh, pointing to, to one dilemma. I think this is another huge dilemma for the tourism industry. How do we keep travel more or less democratic? It's easy in a way to create high-end uh, limited tourism and sort of consider that a success. But the real question is how do we allow with certain controls, the middle class, the you know, lower end people to travel and enjoy the wonderful sites that all of us enjoy and the learning that comes with it, the human exchange, et cetera, et cetera. All of this is, is very important to, to everyone. I think in our country, the national parks have been that vehicle, have been the most democratic, um, accessible recreation area that we have. Na national parks, state parks, the, 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 the uh, protected areas in our country and in many countries. Um, but we're, we're seeing, as, as Kathy's been outlining, that we've got to put limitations even there. We've got to be building. And I think the future is going to be limitations. I think the question is, how do we do that? So for me, for instance, a lottery system is more equitable than raising the price, entrance price. Um, an advanced reservation system is also more equitable uh, than just letting the person who can pay the most or the person who comes with a high end tour operator who can get to the front of the queue, get into a particular venue. So I think we have to think really creatively as we move towards limiting tourism, which is going to be part of the future. How can we do it in ways that really keep it open to all sectors of our, of our society, including nationals from the country? I mean, one of the things, having lived in Africa for many years, that was just heartbreaking was that most Africans never saw the game parks because they couldn't afford to it, they didn't have the transportation, et cetera, et cetera. How do we build in access, particularly for the people whose country it is or whose state it is or whatever, to visit these places and yet not overwhelm them? How do we create limitations, but do it in a way that, that also creates a, a balance for different types of people? Thank you so and much. very important in Kenya and uh, uh, the uh, Masai Mara game parks were open for the first time in affordable ways for mm -hmm. a lot of Kenyans during the hiatus. They couldn't go anywhere else and the game parks couldn't get any high spending uh, international travelers. And uh, there was a bit with a very happy guy from Nairobi and his family who got to see the game parks for the first time in his life. Right, right. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a benefit. 
Yeah. And one last quick thought on that topic. You know, sometimes when a destination starts looking at desirable travelers from a point of impact, it's possible that the highest spending traveler may not even be the desirable traveler because maybe they're the ones who leave the biggest impacts. You know, so I think it's more a matter of destinations making decisions about the desirable traits of a traveler and then shaping the destination and its attractions around those travelers who are compatible with what that destination wants to attract. And that's a whole new way of thinking. Um, you know, the, uh, the low impact traveler, for example, was one, was a traveler that we'd identified in Colorado, one who left a light carbon trail. That traveler was going to be a wonderful fit with, um, you know, with Colorado ethics. So I, again, new kinds, new kinds of thinking and, you know, more money in the pocket isn't necessarily the, the only good. Excellent point. Okay. Well, I will cut us off at that. Thank you all so much. Um, I will hand it over to Martha for any final remarks before Island Press closes us out. Great. Well, thank you, Kelsey. That very interesting discussion. And really, thank you, Arnie, Jonathan, Kathy, for giving us your time and your insights today, and, and those of you in the audience for giving such thoughtful questions. During the early months of the COVID uh, crisis, it seemed impossible that many destinations would actually use the pandemic period to rethink how to deal with over-tourism. But in fact, we've seen that a number of destinations, including Venice and other cities in Europe, as Arnie's talked about, including places like New Zealand and Iceland, and in the US destinations like Colorado, Hawaii, Key West, Juneau, Big Sur, Tahoe, and many of the national parks and state parks are all coming out of the pandemic with new management strategies and other controls on over-tourism. This is the silver lining in an otherwise horrific COVID catastrophe. And it means that going forward, we may, just may, have to see stronger and broader responsible tourism practices. Time will tell, and for sure, we all have work to do to move forward toward, to move forward in pushing the needle towards responsible, regenerative tourism. Thank you all. And now I would like to turn over for the final words to our co-host, Island Press. Thank you, everyone, for participating today. Thank you to our excellent panel and to all of our audience uh, for the questions that you've asked. These are uh, excellent. Um, we have the book available for you at 30% off with the code webinar. Please buy it from islandpress.org if you'd like that discount or you can get it from any uh, retailer that you'd like and independent bookstores as well please take the survey as you exit and we'll have the recording of the veil of the webinar available to you in the next day or two thanks to you all and have a wonderful rest of your day